Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors LLC, Genova Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. There are white tablecloth restaurants. There are restaurants around the country. But there's no restaurant around the country or in the world that has a name of the Palm. The Palm is an institution. The Palm has been around for 85 years, celebrating their 85th year. And today, I have the co-owner of the Palm, Bruce Bonzi. Thanks for being here. Michael, it's a pleasure. So tell me, it's, it's Grandpa, right? He came over, him and his buddy came over in 1920. How, how, tell the uh, story. P.O. Bozzi, my grandfather, and uh, John Ganzi, uh, both immigrated from the uh, same area of Italy, not the same time, but within months of each other, uh, in the teens, actually. Uh, uh, my grandfather wound up in Pennsylvania. He was a coal miner, right? He was a coal miner, that's correct. And uh, John Ganzi wound up in New York and was, became a cook at, I believe, it's Taft, Taft Hotel. Hotel. I, think, I think it was the Taft a long time ago. And uh, they reunited once my grandfather moved back to, to Manhattan, lived on 2nd Avenue. And this little storefront was available on 45th Street and 2nd Avenue. And they uh, decided John was a chef, my grandfather was in front, to take over this little store in 1926. And make and it an Italian restaurant. It was basically a neighborhood Italian restaurant speakeasy because it was during Prohibition. And the... People, there was a fair amount of Italians in, uh, in, that, in, in that neighborhood then. Uh, they would come in for a soup or some, uh, some food and a cup of wine. How'd the name The Palm come out? You told me oh, that's I, a very I, interesting yes, it's, story. It's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting because it's true. Uh, the, the nearest big city where these two men came from in Italy is Parma, P-A-R-M-A. So when they opted to open up this restaurant, that's what they wanted to call it. In filling out, they spoke little or no English. In filling out the necessary papers with the city officials, Board of Health, etc., uh, when asked what they wanted to name the restaurant, they said Parma. Whoever was writing it down misunderstood it as Palm and wrote down Palm, they being, as many immigrants were in those days, a little insecure, just accepted it, thought that if they didn't name it what the man, the official wrote down, they probably would be thrown in jail or, or deported. So they named, they kept it the Palm, and forever since it's been the Palm. The interesting thing about the Palm that when you walk into the 29 locations around the world, uh, they, they see characters. So yes. the characters, how that happen? Yeah, the, the, the characters evolved from what you just alluded to the newspapers. Uh, Third Avenue were heavily Irish populated, First and Second Avenue Italian, but they were the Daily Mirror was down the block. The news is still there and the King Features is still there. The first group of customers who were not of the neighborhood, neighborhood people, to frequent the restaurant 
with the newspaper people and they found, discovered the place. In fact, that's also how we evolved from an Italian restaurant to a steak restaurant. So they would come in and uh, they would uh, uh, partake in food and drink. Uh, and when they had enough to drink, they'd start putting each other on the wall. Or if they couldn't afford to pay the bill, my grandfather would say, okay, you know what? Put your cartoon strip on the wall because a lot of them were, were drawing various cartoon strips, or comics as they called them in those days. So they put them up uh, uh, and that's, and, and then a customer would walk in and say, oh, can I get my picture on the wall? And uh, if they were a good enough customer and they spent enough money, uh, they, we said, sure, and that's what so, happened. But also the fact that some of these people wanted to stay. And what yes, happened? that's exactly right. What happened, they would say, oh, a P.O. or John, can I have a steak? And right across the street, directly across the street, in fact, where Palm 2 is located now, there was a butcher shop. Baldo was the family name. So they would run across the My grandfather would say to the waiter, run across the street to Baldo's and get two steaks. Run across the street, come on back. And slowly but surely, uh, the word went around Manhattan, that if you really want a good steak, go to that little sawdust place on 45th Street and 2nd Avenue. And it just grew from there until we now are a steak restaurant that serves Italian dishes rather than an Italian restaurant that serves steak. Yeah, the, the interesting thing is because the Palm is really the, was the first steak restaurant. As I said when I did Alan Stillman's Life, you know, when he opened up Smith & Walensky, he said it was the Palm and it was Crisella and mm -hmm. there was no one else. It was a different world. That's right. Then. That's correct. Your father is born mm -hmm. and his My father is... And Walter Ganzi, his contemporary, were born, right? right. And, and now the, your father was born in America. Correct. Right. And he joins the business when? He joins the business so uh, in the late 30s, uh, as did his uh, did Walter and they joined as bartenders, they were behind the bar. They both were bartenders. In this small little restaurant at 837 2nd Avenue. That's which, correct. Which is what the 837 Club came That's out. Correct. That's correct. A small little restaurant, very small, maybe seating for what? At the time, probably 35, 40 people. In 1938, they took over the store next door and they made it the second room. So at that point, they probably sat about, oh, 90 people uh, total. Um, and so they worked, started off behind the bar. Uh, my grandfather suddenly passed away in 1942. He's a young man, he was 48 years old. And at that point, Walter and my father came out from behind the bar to work with John Ganzi as, as host. So now let's talk about the, the son. You mm. were born like 1928? Yeah, almost, no, 1939, I was born. Okay, <laughs> uh, you were born in 1939. Right. And you were born in Corona, Queens. That's correct. Right. And you grew up originally in, uh, in Flushing. In Flushing, and then you you moved. And I moved. I lived there until I, well, a couple of uh, uh, in episodes in the army. I was in the army. No, no, we're going to get to the army okay. in, in a little while. <laughs> because I think what you and I said uh, is like every uh, family business. As a kid, you learn the restaurant business also. That's true. I told you I can remember going with my father into the restaurant where I had to stand on the boss rail and hold on just to barely see over the top of the bar. Uh, I had very early recollections uh, of that. And uh, as the years went by, would we work as a, uh, a bus boy? I worked as in the check room. I worked as a waiter. Now, now did your grandmother work at the restaurant? My grandmother did not. No, no, no. She did not work in the restaurant. In fact, no, she did not, nor did Mrs. Gansey. Uh, they were raising a family and uh, they, they just, I don't think it was ever crossed their mind. For now, you, you went to Stuyvesant? I was accepted to Stuyvesant. My father was a graduate of Stuyvesant. Right. I did not go to Stuyvesant. Right, and you went to the... I went to a Catholic school called St. Helena's in the Bronx. Uh, it's now called Monsignor Scanlon. Uh, and uh, because it was a lot closer, I didn't want to take a bus and subway all the way into Manhattan and go to Stuyvesant. Uh, I made a, a good choice. It's wonderful the school Stuyvesant is. I had a great time in high school. Yeah, you were. You played, played baseball, baseball we glee won club. The championship. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, in yeah. glee club. I, I ran track. I, I was a, it was a great time for so me. So, what happens? You, you graduate high school mm -hmm. and you get drafted, right? Did not get drafted. I was accepted at New York University. Uh, so, I graduated in 57. You were there for one year. Went there for one year. At the end of the year, I said I was, I was not doing too well, not because I, I just was not do I was really heavily involved trying to court the woman who would eventually become well, my wife. Subsequently married. That's right. right? Uh, so I wasn't paying attention to school. So I said, you know what, let me do myself a favor. And I pushed up my draft because it knows that, which in retrospect, 
You know, we all do things sometimes by accident and it turns out to be something very fortuitous because had I not pushed up my draft and had I gone and finished four years of college, the draft age at the time was about 22, 23. That's when just when Vietnam started. Uh, it, I, you know, who knows what would have happened. I probably would have gotten drafted. I might have gotten drafted. might have gone to Vietnam. And but you had know. an interesting thing. So you spent two years. Yes, I spent two years in the Army, came out, went back to school. This time went I went to a community city college, United, part New York of city, city Community College, downtown Brooklyn, Hotel and Restaurant Administration. It's a two-year course, uh, Associate Applied Science if you graduate. After my first year, for those who remember, uh, they put up the Berlin Wall, and uh, John Kennedy, who was president, activated 150,000 reservists as a result of that because they, who knew what was going to happen? I was one of the fortunate so, 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 150,000 so, so, so reservists. Two years plus out a year, and now that now they t call me back again. Out of so where did you spend that? Like that when I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, for a year. Then you came back, and, and I came back and finished up. And then you got married. Got married. Uh, sorry, I, no. I came back and got married and then finished, went back to finish school because uh, uh, I had a year left and my daughter, our daughter was born on graduation day. So I didn't make my graduation. I was in the hospital with my but wife giving birth. You know, when I, when I tell the story of the poem, I mean, the poem from 1 to 29 is mm -hmm. really the, the story. So what happens is you finish New York City uh, Community right. College. Uh, in a hospitality mm -hmm. background, and you you take an interview at the New York Hilton. They're just did. opening up the New York I Hilton. Did. And what happens at the New York Hilton? Well, the school I was, because the result of my army, I, I was on the older side of students. So uh, they sent me out. They sent me out for interviews, and New York Hilton was just being built. And I went for an interview. I had a wife who was just about to give birth. Uh, I was working in a liquor store on weekends, making a dollar an hour, delivering 21 hours a week, plus tips. Uh, so I went and I was interviewed by the, f the banquet director, a food and beverage director, I guess he was. And he uh, gave me a quiz. He was asking me questions. If, if the restaurant, a restaurant was called the Seven Hills, what kind of food would you serve? And, you know, I just looked at him. So anyway, I answered the questions. I, Went through the interview, and he, and lo and behold, he offered well, me you a job. job. For $60 he offered me a, a week. job. Sixty bucks a week. Assistant to the food and beverage director. I said, "Wonderful." He says, "And we'll pay you sixty dollars a week." I said, "Thank you, but no thank you." <laughs> right. You had a wife and a baby. <laughs> wife now. and a baby come. So I went to my father. I said, "Dad, you got to give me a job because I thought I would work outside and then bring something to the table." When eventually, which I had planned to work with my father and uh, at the restaurant, but I had <laughs> I couldn't afford it. So I said, "You got to give me a job," which he did. He gave me a job. A uh, hundred dollars a week, gross. So, and you used to get there in the morning, I used early to get there in the about morning, six o'clock in the morning. Uh, I lived in Jackson Heights. Would take the train. I had no car, of course. Take the subway in, get there six, do all the receiving, work lunch, and at three o'clock go home. I did that until Wally, my partner, came to work, and then so we started what, switching. Now, what happens is it's it's interesting. Both your dad and you and you, and his partner mm -hmm. both got ill yes you yes know, yes it, and when and at a young age okay it's like 1960 now it's 60 my daughter was born in 63 so i started working in 63 Six, full 60, time. 60 so by 64 is when wally got that right yeah. so you're there you're 24 now 24 he's like 22 22 and these two kids are running this yeah. steak restaurant yes. you know with, with the sawdust on and the a very busy restaurant a very and, busy yes, restaurant uh, and you were telling me it was there were a couple of things that I'm not sure that there was always this discussion about you know I I, I don't remember this I'm a little younger a little younger I okay know. but you know they, that people would go into a restaurant and you know they'd wear a tie and a jacket and everything yes. and you reform that you basically well I, you know again I wish I could say I was so smart but you know uh, but what happened this was in the '60s uh, and in those days. I think it was just a, 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 a attitude. If restaurants were of a certain price field, a price people just expected to walk in and see men and certainly jackets. It was like going to the theater. Right. People were right. going to the theater. Going, to, theater. With, with, with going to a ballpark. If you see old people going to the Yankee game, they're all dressed up. Anyway, so when I got there and I was 24 years old, it was just at the 60s when the whole subculture was going on. So I started, I figured, you know, I'm not going to turn people away. I started letting people in without jackets and shirts and pants. Got some resistance from the older customers, 
Uh, but for a period, we were the only, again, white tablecloth restaurant in the city that was doing that. So we got a whole bunch of, a whole generation of customers that these other restaurants did not get you, for a couple you know, of years. You know, you talk about generations, and, and this is a great story because I, I, I told you the time when I first went to the Palm through the, my late firm, Bert, and, you know, if people go to the Palm with 85th anniversary, people go with the generations. They take their kids there, then their kids get older, and they go there, and then they take their grandchildren. It's true like a generation restaurant. It, it, it really it is. It is, Michael. Yes, I've heard that. I mean, I, I've been hearing that as long as I'm working there. Uh, do you know my mother and father got engaged in this restaurant? Uh, do you know that used to come here before we went to camp uh, every summer, uh, and now I'm taking my kids and then grandkids. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it's one of the one of the reasons why we've been there because we've replaced so many restaurants don't seem to replace their customers. And that, and that's and we that's, have. And that's the key. You know, how many how many restaurants are 85 years old? How many that's restaurants right. could be around for all these years? But interesting, you also did another initiative thing was, you know, because originally, you know, it was an Italian restaurant and then became a steak restaurant, then a steak with Italian, and then lobsters. And lobster. The change of lobster. lobster. Tell, tell the lobster, lobster story. The lobsters really put us on the map. Uh, uh, when, I, when I started to work in a restaurant, we were serving lobsters. We served lobsters. We served what we call two and a half pounds select, which means that every lobster we had in the house was two and a half pounds, which the purveyor had to hand pick each lobster. And one of the purveyors came to me and said, Bruce, he said, you know, if you give me a little leeway on the size, I can drop the price at the time, 20 or 30 cents a pound, whatever it was. I said to myself, sure, why not? You know, fine. So he started making little, getting, so we got from two and a half to three to three and a half. And next thing you know, we're the only guy in town serving three pound lobsters, three and a half pound lobsters. First of all, everybody's, the old wives tale that big lobsters are tough. So that was one reason why, and we now not only have them, but we're showing people that they're not tough. Well, we developed a reputation again, no longer this, the same because other restaurants have followed us. If you wanted a lobster in New York, you went to the Palm restaurant. That's where you went for a, for a lobster, and that stayed with us for a long time. And that was another impetus of customs that we got. And, and you know, you, we were talking about this. You know, in, in the '30s, the restaurant uh, was you know filled with the newspaper people. Mm. In the '60s, it was filled with the garmentos. It was the people on the very the, much uh, yes, you know, the yes. Seventh Avenue crowd. Seventh Avenue. Avenue. We definitely had the Seventh Avenue crowd. Bias Week in 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 New York would be like fa well, like Fashion Week is now Bias Week in New York. Watch out because we were just loaded. Now, now, now the interesting situation is you're still in 837 with the second sure room, we you are. know. We and, are. and what happens is you close the door and you make a deal with the Chinese restaurant and the bar. Yes, so that, that's I a know. Cute it's, story, it's right. <laughs> well, we, there was time again in the 70s, mo mostly in the 70s, uh, where we would be just so crowded. Uh, even prior, maybe it was even a little bit prior to we opened Palm Two, although it didn't help much when we opened Palm Two. Uh, we would be so crowded that we just could not physically allow anybody else to get in the place. So I'd lock the door, and when people would come in, I would say, I'd go out and say, go and with a restaurant called McCarthy's on one side and, and had, a gold coin on the other side. I said, go have a drink, and I'll come and get you. So after 15 or 20 minutes, whatever it was, I'd go, and I'd knock on the window, and I'd motion them in, and out they would come. Uh, Bill Chan and, and Joe Berger, who are the respective owners, both didn't mind. I mean, they would have loved to keep them there, but... Remember, yeah, they, they got a couple they of got, drinks. They over. got a couple of drinks. Then, then you opened up the second floor. We opened the second floor. Second floor. floor. So you're still at 837, mm -hmm. and then one day, business, because people are waiting outside yes. trying to get in there. Right. You see this Italian restaurant across the street at 840. That's correct. 840 was called La Pace, originally Pasquale's, and then the family who owned Pasquale's lived in the building. Uh, the uh, proprietor passed away, so they sold it to this person, Angela Milani, his name was, and he called it La Pace Italian Restaurant. So we would be busy, and I would be locking, and I would look out the window, or I was outside, and I'd see this man, he would be just with his face overlooking his window, looking at us. He had nobody in his restaurant, and we would jam. So I went to Wally, my partner, and I said, uh, Wally, why don't we just see, I think we can pick this restaurant up across the street, and we'll call it whatever, and it'll be an extension. And you call It'll it be a Palm Two. Well, we 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 came yeah. up with that name at like Palm also. Right. And, but we really opened up thinking it would be just an extension of a dining room, even though it would be across the street, a little bit unusual. People would come in and say, "Listen, you can't hear, but we have a restaurant across the street." 
So much to our, and very pleasantly, surprise, not only did people go across the street, but it developed its own flavor, character, and clientele. There are people who go to Palm 2 who won't come to Palm 1. They love Palm 2. It's developed into a... It's a different person. Diff it's a different person. Exactly right. Well so said, So now it's 1971, and the two kids are still running the mm -hmm, restaurant, mm -hmm. and somebody comes to you and says, Washington, D.C.? Washington, D.C., right. Uh, there was an attorney in Washington that became friendly with uh, my partner, Walter Kansi Jr., and approached us of, with the uh, idea of opening a restaurant in Washington. He and uh, a fellow by the name of Wyatt Dickerson uh, were going to raise some investors, which they did, and uh, they raised the money, and we found this location in Washington, and we opened the restaurant in 1972. Yeah. I, I think we opened in 72. I remember the opening night, uh, kissing you were there. It was, a, we had, it was a big thing in Washington because we, we went to a neighborhood that had not been... Was gentrified. Right, changing. it was being gentrified, so it was, a, it was a big thing for the city for us to come down there, and uh, we opened up. We subsequently have bought out our partners, and we've been there ever since, and it's become but, an institution. But, but an interesting story. Your partner uh, was also close with uh, George Bush Sr. Well, that's how our corporate office got to Washington. Uh, when uh, George Bush Sr. was the ambassador to the United Nations, he and his family lived at the uh, Waldorf in the Towers in the Waldorf, where I think they put up all the ambassadors. Uh, so he, his family was young, the children were young. They would frequent the original Palm relatively often. And uh, Wally, my partner, became not only a customer uh, employee uh, relationship, but a friend. And when when uh, President Bush moved, uh, Wally stayed in touch with him, and when he ran for uh, uh, president uh, the first time nomination, uh, he got involved in his campaign and he, when he lost the nomination to Ronald Reagan. Uh, uh, and then when he ran for president again, Wally became his co-chairman, and he was in between wise, Wally, not the president. I, he said, you know, I have to move to Washington. So why don't we just open, we had a little, corporate upstairs. I said, why don't we just open an office so it'll give you a base. And so we opened our office in Washington and uh, uh, it's grown and that's where it's to this day still exists. So then what, how about Los Angeles? You had this 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 author who wrote The Exorcist, yes. right? Yes. What happened on that? Well, after we opened the restaurant in Washington, the William Blatty, who wrote The Exorcist, they were filming that film in Washington. If, if you remember seeing it, Correct. part of it's in Georgetown, yeah, you know, Georgetown with the embassy. So he right. was down there with his wife, and he started to frequent the restaurant. Wally, who was working in that restaurant, I was in New York. They started to talk, and he approached Wally, who, and then me, about opening a restaurant in Los Angeles, uh, and he became our partner in that, which we did. We opened in '75, I think, in Los Angeles. Wally again was in between wives, so just getting so. Instead of we're looking for a manager, instead of hiring one, he it was out. easy. Move, it was easy. Just move, move the out. partner out there. That's, move, move, that's move. right. He would get a divorce. He'd open a restaurant. Uh, uh, so he went out there, and uh, again in a neighborhood that probably wasn't top of the line then, but now it's in West yeah, Hollywood. It's it's really a very nice neighborhood. And uh, again, like Washington's become an institution out. In now, how do you open up the uh, the second restaurant in? Um, oh, in Los, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, the uh, Staples Center was being developed. That's the uh, that athletic arena uh, in downtown Los Angeles. And we were approached uh, by people uh, because it was a wasteland down there. People had moved out. It was it, not a good neighborhood. Uh, but with the Staples Center coming on board, uh, they approached us. And we built, I, I, I think, is one of our nicest restaurants. Uh, and uh, we opened up. And uh, we were correct. Uh, it became an instant success, huge, because at the time we were the only restaurant down there. Since then, there have been now. Were, were, were there other marriages in between that you opened up in Houston, Let's Dallas? See. Let's other see. Other yes. Yeah. Well, no, you're right. No, there is because from Los Angeles we opened up Houston, and he went to Houston with another another wife. I think. Yes. Yeah. He's on his sixth wife. This is a lovely lady, and I think it's going to be. And where, where are they living now? They're Lincoln? living in Naples, Florida. Oh, they, no what? restaurant in Naples, though. No. <laughs> No, no, no. Have no, a Florida no. restaurant? No, we do have a Florida. We ha we're in uh, North Miami. North, North we're Miami. in Orlando, and we're in Tampa. Yeah. Uh, but not Naples, no. I mean, how do you determine to open up in Atlanta and these other cities? If we, I may regress for a moment, if, uh, and you shouldn't remember, there was a time when 
people didn't think white tablecloth restaurants would travel very well. Uh, in the 60s, I think it was, the 21 Club opened in Chicago, but they didn't call it 21, they called it, I think, cricket or something, and it didn't work out very well. So people didn't think it could. So we, when we opened in Washington, and we started to open up these restaurants, uh, kind of spawned, even though uh, Ruth Fertel takes credit for being the first steak restaurant chain to expand. It's not true. We were. Uh, 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 so, you know, but we did it very carefully because we, we were small company, just two people. We didn't open as quickly as some of the other restaurants. And so we would do a study. We'd find that we'd, we'd, a city, we'd identify a city that we thought we could support a palm. We'd do a market study on various locations, and then we would make a decision, uh, uh, work with a with landlord. Uh, uh, which, which in the case of New York, you've done well, because we have. you then opened up in 1999, you went over to the west side. Correct. A neighborhood okay. also in transition. That people, was, yes. You know, yes, was, yes. Was questionable, and really, you know, you gotta give the Resnicks a lot of credit, because that was not a residential neighborhood, and they built, no. a, they built a building called the Gershwin, That's and right. you opened up in that building in the That's Gershwin, right. and then, in 2008, you opened up in Tribeca. Which is another Resnick. Which is another right. Resnick building, yep. but in this situation. So right now, it, it's you and your partner. Mm -hmm. Your son's in the business. My son is in the business. He's been in for a while. He is a, an executive vice president in charge of marketing and human resources. Uh, we are attempting, I think successfully, to make him the face of uh, our business. Uh, he's very, very capable. Let's get to the taste. family. We've got about yes. a minute left. Married for 49 years, your right. wife's name is? Mary Ann. Mary Ann. You had a daughter born? 1963. In, right, on the graduation June 13th, day. That's right. your daughter of? Son in 66. Her name is? Andrea. And she lives with her three sons in Washington, D.C. And the names of the grandchildren? Nicholas, Lucas, and Daniel. And, and Ava Rose. My son has a three-year-old so daughter. A, right. And your, your, your son commutes? He, he does. He commutes uh, from Los Angeles. Most of the year, in the summertime, he moves to the East Coast for the summer, seeing so his partner. So, you know, if you, if you look at it this way, you know, there aren't too many 85-year-old institutions that produce the, the, the finest steak, uh, lobster, uh, chops, and, uh, you know, you and your partner and the family has truly been builders of New York's a great New York life story, and thanks for being here today. Michael, thank you very much. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American.